On this episode of Fox Body Rehab, we talk Go Fast Goodies goals and then reintroduce everybody to our Hemmings team before they rip into our 1991 Fox Body Mustang. And that's coming up right now on Fox Body Rehab. Hey, I'm Terry McGeehan. I'm the editor-in-chief here at Hemmings for our Muscle Machines magazine. I have been in a Fox Mustangs a long time. I've got a 93 LX myself that I've owned since 1996. And this is kind of like a very pleasant deja vu. It, uh, it's very familiar. Um, a lot of things are coming back to me. And it just seems like it's a sort of a fun way to revisit a lot of the stuff we did back then. Hi, my name is Glenn Sauer. I'm the local car guy here in town. and. Got a phone call, they were doing a Fox body. We did the IROC last year together, and uh, as a C10 guy, I guess I can plow through this for a few days with them. So as I was talking about in the in-car video that I did with the Fox body, you know, the idea is to kind of create something that you would have seen on the street in the late 80s, in the early 90s, if you were a Fox body Mustang fan. Now, you know, that was kind of when I grew up, that's where Terry grew up. Terry already owns a Fox Body Mustang of his own that he's had for a number of years. How many years? Since 96. Okay, so forever, right? So when Terry and I started talking about the project, we kind of sat and we ideated around what parts we would do and how we wanted the car to look. And as we're both huge Fox Body fans, I kind of left it to Terry to say, okay, well, what's the parts list, man? And so what did you come up with? Well, so you've talked already about how we both agree that we're not building the world's killer Fox Mustang here because today that's an LS with turbos on it that's blindingly fast. What we're doing is trying to recreate something that would have been really cool back in the day you're talking about, in the 80s and the 90s when these things were what you had and what you wanted to have if you didn't, right? So we also realized we don't want to go in the motor on this thing. We know that it's healthy, but we have limited time to get this done and we feel like if we go in here, we're asking for trouble. Can of worms. Because the initial reaction was, oh, heads, cam, intake, right. done. So then if we didn't want to go in the motor, then what do we do? Well, if you're not gonna go in the motor, just Get add a boost. boost. <laughs> and uh, so that was a thing people did back then too, when centrifugal superchargers were kind of coming back into vogue. Uh, Procharger was one of the people who came out with a they great kit the back then. Yeah. Their kit was interesting because it had an intercooler, whereas a lot of the superchargers back then didn't. Mm -hmm. That allowed you to run not just a cooler charge, but more boost. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very efficient setup, and the kit they made was actually smog legal back then, which was also a big deal, and that was not the norm. Yeah. It's still not necessarily the norm, and they still have that kit, but they've evolved it over the years. So we reached out to them, they still have it. It's got an even better supercharger as part of the kit now. So that's going to be kind of the focal point of what right. we're going to do. And that is going to add, according to them, like 60 to 85 percent more power. OK. And I remember back in the day, I'm dating myself, but I remember when this kit came out and I was working in a magazine and we put one on a bone stock 5.0, which is what it's intended for. And the car went 11s, which well, was kind of crazy. Well, think of it like this. When you talk about a 60 to 80 percent increase in power, we took this thing to the dyno and we made 176 horsepower and 225 pound feet yep. at the wheels, which is pretty consistent for a car that's really 32 years old with, you know, 112,000 miles on it. With that said, why don't we head over to the bench and start talking about some parts? That sounds great. All right, cool. So the focal point of our project is the supercharger kit from Procharger. This is where we're going to make all our power. And here's a supercharger, and if it looks like a turbocharger, it pretty much is a belt-driven turbocharger. It's very efficient. This kit came out in the 90s, but that supercharger is an upgraded unit. It does not require an external oil line, which is great. It's the SC, self-contained, that Procharger does. So you add some of their fluid to it, and that's it. No drain back line, none of that. Uh, one of the great things about the Procharger kits is the intercooler. This is going to cool the charge, obviously, but it also allows us to run more boost. This kit in its smog legal configuration makes nine pounds of boost, but it's capable of going all the way up to 14 pounds. The intercooler is an integral part of that. 
Now this FMU here is fuel management unit. That's going to allow us to provide extra fuel because we're not doing any electronic tuning on this. Back in the 90s, you really couldn't do that on a Fox Mustang. Today we could, we're going to do it the old school way. This kit is created so you don't need to do any tuning when you put it on a stock motor. The FMU is going to boost fuel pressure and that's going to take care of what we need. And then the belt drive is also going to live with all the other things that are already in there, including the air conditioning which is great. We're not going to have to do a lot of cutting or drilling or modifying. The kit is pretty much a bolt-in. The instruction manual on this kit is really thorough, so we're feeling pretty good about the install on this. The list of tools needed is pretty short, so we think we're going to be in good shape. So we're going to get to work with Classic Industries again on this project. That's great. You guys know that they make lots of restoration parts for lots of cars, and now they've got tons of stuff for Fox Mustangs. And if you've ever been around a Fox Mustang, you know there's a lot of parts on them that wore out really quickly, even back when the 80s were still going on. A key element that we're getting for this car are these quarter glasses. Now, as if you know, if you ever looked at a Mustang, these things, these rubber moldings, they would start to deteriorate really quickly. Uh, the sunlight would hit them and break them down, and they are part of the glass, so you can't replace just the moldings. Ford obviously used to sell these. They haven't sold them for years. Classic Industries now has brand new ones, so we're going to put some new glass in our car, fresh new moldings. We've got the matching door top moldings to go with them. We've got some new taillight lenses. Ours are kind of warped. That cow piece, that always breaks on Mustangs. Ours isn't broken yet, but we have to take it off to put in the new windshield that we're also getting from Classic Industries. And we might break it when we take it off because it's brittle and old and it doesn't look great anyway. New map pockets, ours are all stretched out like they are in every Fox Mustang. A new console top with the ashtray, that always broke on these cars. Classic Industries actually has a different version of this that has cup holders in place of the ashtray, which we've already realized we should have gotten instead of this because we're missing cup holders already. If you know anything about Foxes, you know that's a power door lock actuator. They always break, Classic Industries has those. And all that other interior stuff, little bits and pieces that broke on these cars, even in the 80s, Classic's got it all. We've ordered a whole bunch of that stuff and we'll show you how to replace it when we get to that part. So Summit Racing Equipment is back on board for this project, which is great because you can get pretty much everything from Summit and it even gets here to Vermont really fast. We've got a ton of stuff from them. This stuff is more of the drag racing based parts that we're gonna use on this project. We started with some weld-in frame connectors. Those plates are torque box reinforcements that they sell as a kit. We'll weld those in to make sure the unit body doesn't get damaged on hard launches. 9010 drag struts, which we got, they're some its own. We may upgrade those to an adjustable unit. The 9010 means there's 90% resistance to compression, 10% resistance to extension. You wanna get the front of the car up and hold it there on a launch but they're not for street use. We may get adjustable units so we can click it back to something more around 50-50 for driving on the street. We also got some upgraded rear control arms. These are also Summit brand. They're stiffer, they've got urethane bushings. The stock arms are stamped steel and they've got big fat rubber bushings in them. They move around a lot when you put sticky tires on the car for drag racing. Uh, of course, 90s style drag stuff in a Fox Mustang, you gotta have your pillar pod gauges complete with auto meter ultralights. We needed a boost gauge and a fuel pressure gauge. We'll get more into that when we do the install. Gotta have a line lock for the drag strip and the Hurst roll control is a good way to go. And they make a kit that's just for the Fox Mustang. So these brake lines are pre-bent to fit the Fox. The bracket is for a Fox. Should make installation a lot easier. Our car is automatic. We need a way to shift that reliably. That's a B&M hammer shifter. And this is made also for a Fox. You can get the hammer for whatever, but this kit has the mounting plate and a boot so it'll fit in the stock console and other than the shifter coming out of it, it'll look stock. So this is the Summit stuff that's really aimed at the drag strip. We've got a bunch of other Summit parts that you'll see throughout the build. So we talked about how our Mustang is an automatic. That means it's got Ford's AOD transmission, that's automatic overdrive. It's a four speed overdriven in fourth gear and it's not really a high performance transmission. But we're going to stick with it. Automatics are pretty good for drag racing, even though back in the day, if you had a 5.0, you would probably have gotten a five speed. We're going to make this work and we're going to do it with some help from a place in Canada called Lentech. Now, back in the 90s, I went up and did a story with these guys. They were doing some really interesting things with the AOD, mostly based around the valve body. They were taking stock valve bodies and recalibrating them to change the shift pattern. That's one of the hangups on the AOD. The shift pattern only has three positions, so it's first, drive, overdrive. 
and it means we can't hold second gear without doing the AOD shuffle. That was the one to two and back to one. That's not really great for the transmission. It doesn't give you the right kind of control. Lentech would take the valve body, recalibrate it, and add an electric solenoid to lock out overdrive from an electric button inside the car. So then your shift pattern is one, two, drive, and it will go in overdrive if the button is in the right position. So we got one of those uh, valve bodies, which is also going to firm up the shifts. It's also going to raise full throttle shift points a little bit. And then to go with that, we got a converter from Lentech. This is a 24 to 2600 stall unit. And then this shaft here is going to take our AOD and remove the direct drive function that comes from the factory. So it's not going to be a lockup transmission anymore, but that's okay. We'll still have overdrive. We can still drive on the highway. And then this is the electronic stuff that will help us control the overdrive. And it's a fairly simple install. We'll get into the details when we get to that part. POR15 is now a Hemmings Garage sponsor, which has worked out great for us because they make a whole broad line of products. They're the kind of things we use all the time. Now, you might be familiar with POR15 from the original paint over rust product that's been around a long time. It's a three-step process. You use a degreaser and then a metal prep, and then you brush on the actual POR15 product. You can paint over rust. You can use it on metal that's been cleaned from rust and it seals out any further rusting. That's great for the rusty old junk that we tend to work on here, uh, and it's great for a variety of things. But POR15 makes a lot of other stuff. In fact, they make a ton of different spray paints. Again, we use this cast iron gray, they have a chassis black, they've got aluminum paint, they've got brake caliper coatings, they've got all kinds of stuff we've even not known about before. This kit here is these three products into a small batch. So if you've got a small job to do, you can just get this. You don't need to buy a lot of the product. So our Mustang's in really good shape, but underneath still has typical rust. Not rot, but a lot of surface rust and some other things that are corroded. So we're gonna get a chance to use a lot of the products POR15 makes. We're gonna use some of the original product on part of the floor pan that's kind of crusty, and you'll see how it works then. U.S. Radiator is coming on to work with us again on this project, which is great because we discovered that our Mustang has some kind of cheap aluminum and plastic replacement radiator in it. That's become really common when you go to get a radiator for one of your cars that are older that came with a brass copper radiator and the replacement turns out to be plastic and cheap aluminum. U.S. Radiator makes brass copper radiators brand new. They make this one for the Fox, which looks like a stock one and it is considered a drop-in replacement, but it has a larger core to offer more cooling. So it's not gonna be a problem to install it. It's gonna look stock, but it's gonna offer greater cooling and we can get rid of the cheap plastic one. So we're serious about taking this thing to the drag strip once we get it done. Even though it's a street strip car, we wanted to have a sticky tire so we could actually get the thing to go as fast as we hope it will go. We went to Mickey Thompson because that's what you do when you want a sticky tire, right? We were gonna use drag radials and Mickey Thompson does offer drag radials, but then we found out Mickey Thompson now has an ET Street R, which is a new thing. It's uh, a DOT legal tire that looks a lot like a slick, but you can see it does have some tread siping in it. You can drive to the track on these if you want to. And then to go with them, we got the uh, ET Front Rs, which are also DOT legal. They're lightweight like the regular old ET fronts. Um, they match in tread pattern. Again, we like the idea that you could put these on and drive to the track if you live near your track. We needed lightweight wheels, so we went with Race Star. These are lightweight. Um, they're four lug because we decided to stay with four lug on our car. That's what guys did back in the day. Uh, you can get these in a five lug too if you want to do that. That is what a lot of people do with Fox Mustang these days. But four lug was available. We went with it. Uh, the wheels match. They're lightweight. They're a nice argent gray color, and they're reasonably priced. So we've got a good wheel tire package. I don't think we're going to drive to the track on them, but we could if we wanted to. We like having that option. Back in the day when you got your 5 liter Mustang, the first thing you wanted to do was get gears for it because these things came with 273s as a standard gear. Ours still has that. Then we discovered that the Posi, the limited slip traction lock, was kind of worn out, would barely do two wheel burnouts. We wanted to get upgraded axle shafts for it because we knew we were going to run a sticky tire. And then Junior discovered that the rear end housing in the car is leaking between the center section and one of the axle tubes. So we went to the guys at Mosier. They were making axle shafts back in the day for the five liter community. Today they have a full array of complete rear end packages and all the parts you could need. We brought our list to them and what came out of that was what's in this crate.
This is the Mosier Engineering M88 Muscle Pack Crate Rear End Package. It's a little more than we thought we'd be getting into when we started the project, but once we discovered some of the things we wanted to upgrade and some of the problems our original rear end had, it just started to make a lot of sense. Now these packages are customizable. There's a long list of options you can choose from. We went with a true track differential. That's a gear type limited slip. We also wanted to upgrade axles to 31 spline, but Mosier guys showed us that 33 spline barely costs anything more, and obviously that's a better upgrade. We've got the girdle on here for a little extra strength. The housing is stock dimensions, just like the rear end that's in the car now, but it's ready to go. We don't have to set up gears. We don't have to set any of the uh, adjustments that come from the factory. We're ready to go. The housing's powder coated. And dollar for dollar, when we did all the addition to see what our upgrades and the labor to build a rear end was gonna cost, it just made a lot of sense. Hello, my name's Junior Nevison. I am the shop manager here at Hemmings. I also host Hemmings Garage. I don't have a lot of experience with Fox Body Mustangs, but I'm really looking forward to doing this supercharger as opposed to the typical Coyote swap. Now that Terry has gone through the parts list, it was finally time to get to work. We begin by doing a thorough inspection of the car before moving on to the initial teardown. Now, out of the gate, Junior was impressed by some initial design elements of the Mustang's engineering, as down the road, he knew it would make his life easier. Here's an example of good engineering. Right here, the subframe bolts are actually accessible on these Fox bodies, where on like the IROC, they're buried up inside the frame, so if the slugs spin up in there, now you've got all kinds of problems. These you can access if they're rusty, torch them off, done, get new clip nuts, off you go. This is the kind of stuff I appreciate. <laughs> there we go, there we go. That looks really good. I was expecting to find a bunch of rust behind here. You get these body seams right here. You get dirt in there and they blow out. Same with in here for the substructure, but this is actually really nice in here. All right, uh, what was I doing? And where did my light go? All right, man, so it looks good from the outside. It does. Um, but this is the first time I've seen it, well, in the air. So yeah. what are we looking at? Because I'm seeing a lot of scaling. I'm seeing stuff that at first glance, not terrible, but have you found anything that you're like, ooh, that's not good? Nothing real bad. Okay. The history is this was a Florida car, so it has the salt air mm -hmm. surface rust. Yep. It's not New England rotten yeah, right yeah, yeah. through, full of Bondo, uh, but there's definitely some issues. Nothing really, really bad. Um, there's definitely some rust up above the axle where they couldn't get uh, yeah. undercoating, yep. so we'll do a little POR there. That fuel filter looks 100% original. I believe that is 100% original, oh, which is okay. <laughs> definitely going to get changed. Okay. Uh, definitely need to do that. We'll probably be doing the fuel lines as well. Okay. Um, once we got it back here, we got it up in the air. Somebody had very professionally oh. RTV'd this axle tube that had twisted, and we didn't see it was leaking when we looked at it. But okay. I guess this is a common problem with the 8.8. You do yeah. a lot of hard launches, mm -hmm. the plug welds give away. The exhaust has a little bit of surface rust, but I think we're gonna go with it, because you heard it. Yeah, no, the it, exhaust sounds it great. It sounds great, so I see no need to replace the whole thing. Okay, so. well that's good. We can salvage what we can. I mean, yep. I was looking at the shocks before, that looks blown. That one's gone. It is gone. Okay, that so I'm not seeing things. That one's completely gone. I think this one is seized up. I think it blew a long time ago. So, but, you know, that, okay. that's easy stuff. This um, doesn't look bad. I mean, this is just scaling stuff. This is yes. what I'm not worried about. Yeah. But over here, the rest of the undercarriage of the car actually looks really solid. I'm willing to bet somebody got under there with a wire brush and yeah, you know, a little, little undercoating because this is what everybody looks at. You yeah. know, or the floorboard's good. Okay. So when we looked at it, it's like, yeah, it looks great. No, this is this yeah. is all right, man. Anything up yeah. here in the suspension that, that kind of triggers you or not no, too bad? No, everything really looks kind of good. Okay, good. Um, nothing that I really noticed. Uh, you know, we definitely do have some brake lines up here that are getting a little crispy, so. Okay. We've got a full kit. We're going to replace all that. Um, I did do a transmission service. Okay. And something that I didn't realize, I found this down inside the transmission. Okay. Which got me a little nervous. Little research. Well, forward on the assembly line sticks this where the dipstick goes as it goes through the assembly line. So that and then when in. they get to where they're going, they put the dipstick tube in. This falls right in the pan. So this tells me nobody had ever serviced the transmission in 112,000 miles. 
And in 32 years. 32 years. Oh, dear God. Yeah. Okay. But you felt it. Shift no, it shook fine. That's yeah, okay. It does everything it's supposed to do. So, okay. yep. Yeah. Um, we did discover just recently that our fan blade here is. Oh, we got, got a crack. Yeah, okay. the plastic is going, so I right, we'll had to get that. another one of those. Well, that's good. I'm glad it yeah. actually stayed together and didn't blow itself through the radiator yeah, because I've yeah, seen that happen. That's something I'm going to have to check out more often, but, I mean, it's not a leaker. It doesn't look like it's been taken out booty bashing or off-roading or anything like that. You know yeah. what? This, at 12 grand? For a 32-year-old uh, car. I'm good with it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, happy with it. Time to start ripping in? Yeah. It's time. Cool. After a thorough front to back inspection, it was time to let Junior and the crew rip into the old Mustang and prep it for our Pro Charger install. Before that happened, though, the guys had to disconnect and remove a bunch of ancillary parts from the front and top of the engine that would be inspected and then reused during final assembly. There we go. Yep, mouse house. We have mouse house. Of course, every car has at least one mouse house. Now that the road testing review is done and Terry has gone through all the parts, well, it's time to dive in and start getting the mechanics done on this car. So Junior, what's the first step? First step's gonna be get the hood out of the way so we okay. can all fit in here. <laughs> uh, we gotta pull the front fascia off so we can get the intercooler in. We gotta pull the battery, relocate that, pull the whole intake system, and then we're gonna mount the jewelry, put the charger on. So we're doing the blower first? Yes set up all the plumbing for that, okay. get the fascia back on, then we do the fuel system, and it's easy as that. All right. Oh, look at that. Reassembly. I like reassembly. <laughs> then we get to test the final product. This assembly is easy. Any, any monkey can disassemble. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's all yours, man. Uh, right now, I'm seeing a really clean front. We've got a brand new AC condenser that somebody installed prior to us. Obviously, they didn't mount it, um, but everything is just fantastic. I don't see any front end damage or anything in this. I'm really pleased with this car. It's coming apart great. As Junior mentioned, the reassembly part of any build is where things get really fun. And for us, that fun meant it was time to install our new Pro Charger kit. Thankfully, the kit comes with one of the most comprehensive installation manuals we've ever seen, complete with well thought out and informative instructions and a slew of color photos, which made Junior and the crew very happy. What's up, man? Oh, we're just getting ready to actually dive into the blower install. So we've got the radiator out and the fascia off. We actually didn't need to take the radiator out for this kit, uh, according to the instructions, which, by the way... Dude, not for nothing, this is like their... It's, it's like the nicest instruction manual I've ever it's seen. It's an actual manual. And With it, color photos. I've read through the whole thing once already. Junior's read it too. And I think Junior was heard to say this is the most amazing <laughs> aftermarket kit manual he's ever seen. And it really is good. Uh, it's very clear. There's a lot of color pictures, yeah. and we're actually reading the instructions. Way so, to go, Pro uh, Charger. So the next thing up is, uh, believe it or not, you don't have to do that much disassembly on this yeah. thing. And all these things can stay in place. We actually didn't need to take the radiator out, but we're going to change it to a new one, and it's just going to make more room for us. So we got a new radiator from U.S. Radiator, and you know they specialize in copper brass units. This car originally had a copper brass radiator, but this one's got three rows. It's a much thicker core. I think the original was a two row. And the radio that was in it before was a plastic aluminum replacement, which that seems to be what you get out of the parts stores now. So this is going to add some extra cooling. That's going to be critical because with the intercooler up there, we're going to need a little extra of a core size to make sure this thing stays cool. We're just going to drop it in. All right, so the supercharger is all mounted up, the intercooler is mounted, that plumbing is pretty much worked out. But you can see we've got the upper intake manifold off. That's not normally part of the installation of this supercharger kit. You don't need to do that normally. The kit is made to work with the 19 pound per hour injectors that a Mustang comes with. We originally were going to just put a fresh set of 19 pound injectors in it, but after going to the dyno 
and Kevin Martin there recommended that we upgrade to 24 pound per hour injectors. The supercharger kit actually has alternative tuning adjustments for the FMU to accommodate 24 pound per hour injectors. So doing that's gonna take us away from the ragged edge of being unable to deliver enough fuel. So we've got a fresh set of injectors. We're gonna pop them in. We'll put the intake back on. We've got to do our fuel pump upgrades and then we should be ready to start the car up. And I'm just marking for the bracket locations. And this goes just after the fuel filter. Right now, basically got an auxiliary fuel pump that is gonna put extra pressure to the fuel system once we get up on boost, because you don't want to lean the motor out. So we have one internally on the tank and we're gonna have one externally. And fuel management unit is basically going to boost our pressure as we need it once the boost goes up. And hopefully we'll keep detonation to zero, not a minimum zero. We want none. After installing the Pro Charger, the intercooler, our new 24 pound per hour injectors, and the new fuel pump upgrade, the guys buttoned up the Mustang and prepped it for the initial startup. Wow. That was like, that was 100% uneventful. Holy crap. It runs good. It runs, it runs better. Great. We got oil pressure, we're charging. That went a hell of a lot better than I thought it was gonna go. We got the whistle. That. I mean, you've got the blower noise now. Okay, so now that everything is installed, we don't, we're not seeing any leaks and the car is actually running a hell of a lot smoother, we think because of the new injectors. We're gonna take it back to the dyno shop and start to do some tuning with it. With the sweet sound of a blower whistle resonating in the ears, it was now time for a return trip to Twisted Synergy Motorsports for another run at the dyno to see just how much power we gained with our newly installed blower. Before we did that, however, we couldn't resist having just a little bit of parking lot fun to make sure that, well, you know, everything worked correctly. With the Mustang now strapped back onto the dyno, and with our pre-estimate power guesses logged into our heads, we handed the keys back over to shop owner Kevin Martin, where he'd soon reveal the Mustang's new power figures. This is a solid pull. I, I was watching the air fuel. Yeah. What did what'd you see? Under three. Just under? Just yeah. under. Just yeah. under. Looks like I'm buying dinner. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's just wait. Let's wait for Kevin. <laughs> let's see what we got. Well, it looks like we made some power this time. Uh, what'd you? What were you thinking? I was at 302. 302. I said 275. 255. 255. 306. See, Ooh. I always know stuff sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Great. it is. It's fine. Good. <laughs> this is good. How much torque did it make? Uh, let's go back and look. About 334, 335. That's not bad. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. We were at, so we, we went up from what, 172 and 225? Yep. That's, yeah, that's a substantial that's, that's game. Pretty that's pretty good. Considering the, engine, the rest of the yeah. engine is completely stock. 306 horsepower and 334 pound-feet of torque. That's a huge improvement over what our stock 5-liter made on its initial dyno pull. So, with that knowledge in hand, we just couldn't resist a few more rips around the parking lot at Hemmings HQ, because after that it was on to the lift for some undercarriage disassembly and some major test fitting which would ultimately take us closer to our goal of building the street and drag race bruiser we had always talked about.